Um, it's funny how quickly you feel you lose um, your skills in one job you used to have when you find yourself doing another job that's very different. And I, of course, spend my time now thinking about um, visa refusal rates. And so um, it's quite nice to have the opportunity to um, stop and think about Newman. Although I'm not an expert on Newman um, by any means, um, and you've had people that have shared papers with you who um, have um, far greater expertise in, in Newman as a person, as a theologian, um, as an educator perhaps. What I'm really interested in is um, teaching and learning and student formation, or really going further than that, student transformation. And um, what I want to do today is to share with you um, a paper um, that um, has already been published in a um, journal called Educational Futures, which is the journal of the British Education Studies Association. And um, there are some copies of that if anybody is interested and wants to take one away. Um, but I'll also give you the, the web reference for that paper at the end. Um, so thank you very much for coming, and it will be um, good to have something of a debate with you at the end of this. Um, what I intend to do, really, is, is to go through the paper um, and to highlight some particular thoughts to you. Um, and as I say, what I'm interested in is student formation and transformation. And although Newman didn't articulate it in that way, to um, look at his philosophy and some examples of his writing... Um, where perhaps if he was writing today, he might have used those terms himself. So, okay, and I should um, thank Heather particularly for giving me the opportunity to do this. So. Okay, so um, Newman had a special interest in student formation and what it meant to be an educated person. He explored these notions within his writings conducted in the educational context of a 19th century university. And although writing in the 19th century, what I seek to um, articulate really is how Newman's experiences as a student, as a practicing Christian, a university tutor and an ordained cleric are as influential to discussion of university education today as they were in the 1850s. Um, you will know um, a lot about who Newman was, what it was that had influenced him, his own educational experiences. I'm sure those have all been discussed in some detail already in this seminar series. And so um, I'm not going to go into those in particular detail. But Newman's idea of a university was a text, of course, that has gone on to influence thinking about higher education in the 20th and 21st centuries. Although it's interesting to note that at the time of its publication, it didn't receive that much interest. For some of us teaching and researching in universities today, his ideas of what a university education should consist of are still deeply significant. And perhaps this is even more so with the increase in marketization and commoditization of institutions and courses. And so I think it's appropriate at this time of significant change in higher education policy and provision that we should pause and reflect on some of the deeper questions that affect us. And I don't mean how much should a course cost or which institution is at the top of the league tables or 96th in the league tables. Um, but, but what is a university? How might a university contribute to the formation of individuals and society and perhaps with reference to Newman today, are the thoughts of Newman little more than historic reflections of an era long past? Or do they have something of relevance for us still? Newman's family, as you will probably know, were London bankers. And as such, he had a relatively privileged early education, attending Great Ealing School in London. He was a pupil there in its heyday when it was considered one of the best schools in England, and this gave him a classical education and initiated him into the educational environment of the elite establishment, where he developed a strong interest in classical philosophy and literature. 
He then became a student of Trinity College, Oxford, where he studied widely and had something of what could be described as a liberal education. He particularly enjoyed the tutorial system, which gave him close contact with academic scholars, both students and tutors. And this emphasis on relationships as a vehicle for exploring one's own thoughts and those of others can be traced through his writings, and much of his philosophy on education is built around this Oxford tutorial model, where relationships were at the heart of it. He graduated from Trinity, but only with a third-class honours, and was determined to do better. He funded further studies for himself by tutoring school pupils, and then won a fellowship at Oriel College in 1822. Oriel was renowned for its own intellectualism and had already produced several significant churchmen. It provided Newman with an environment and community in which he was able to develop academically, studying philosophy and theology, professionally with his aspirations for ordination, and personally with his own relationship with God. This academic, professional and personal learning could be considered to be important to his ideas of student formation. And I'll pick up those three different areas of knowledge and learning later. Newman drew on his experiences at Oxford when he established the oratory in Birmingham. He was seeking to establish a Catholic version of an Oxford college, as Catholics were not permitted to enrol at Oxford. Newman was requested by the Irish Catholic bishops to go to Dublin in 1854 as rector of the newly established National University of Ireland, and it was during this time that he really developed his ideas about the university. He retired, though, after four years, frustrated with his general lack of progress on the venture, preferring instead to pursue his own scholarship and writing. And, of course, after that point, he published various texts and collections of lectures on the universities and its disciplines. Newman had been influenced by the classical Greek culture promoted in the mid to late 1800s, a time which did not have our contemporary aspirations for mass education and empowerment of women. The prevailing culture of universities in the 19th century England was that knowledge was largely the preserve of the wealthy, and the masses were to give their attention to commerce, business, industry and production, as opposed to study. When Newman was a university fellow and rector, the student body was therefore made up of the male elite, such as the sons of upper-class merchants and noblemen. Contrastingly, universities today are places of social change. They're measured in relation to their widening participation achievements in part. And it might be said that modern universities have become focused on outputs rather than knowledge, with students viewed as clients and outcomes measured by degree classifications rather than personal academic development. Newman, though, was interested in the student's participation in the process of study and of learning, rather than focusing on the student's examination success or failure. It was the engagement in study and the process of learning, supported by strong relationships, which Newman thought were key to a university education. He articulated this in his description of what he understood a university to be. And this is a quote from Newman. I protest to you, gentlemen, that if I had to choose between a so-called university which dispensed with residents and tutorial superintendents and gave its degrees to any person who passed an examination in a wide range of subjects, and a university which had no professors or examinations at all, but merely brought together a number of young men for three or four years. If I must determine which of the two courses was the most successful in training, moulding, enlarging the mind, which produced better public men, men of the world, I have no hesitation in giving the preference to the university which did nothing over that which exacted of its members an acquaintance with every science under the sun. In Newman's comparison of the two universities, the first is about knowledge transfer, 
The second has a focus on relationships as a facilitator of learning and on dialogue as a process of learning. It is in this latter which Newman opened the debate about university education being more than just knowledge. He was able to articulate a deeper and more sustained debate about the formation of the student as opposed to education as a knowledge-based enterprise. Come back to that one for you. This gave an emphasis to student formation as opposed to just academic information. This commitment to student formation can be traced through Newman's own higher education experiences of the tutorial system at Oxford, where he developed close relationships with tutors and peers, and through which he was able to explore his own academic and personal development as a process of learning. For Newman, the university was not a foundry or a mint or a treadmill. That is to say, it was not a place of production of students in a mechanical or industrial sense, but rather it was a place for student development, for exploring ideas, for sharing thoughts. For Newman, university education was about the process of learning, and he articulates this process as the movement onward, as locomotion. This implies that a student cannot be passive in the process of learning and disengage from it, but rather has to be actively engaged in his or her own learning. That it is a process which demands the student to give of oneself. For him, there was a difference between inquiring of knowledge and the commanding of it, of understanding it, rather than just a memorization of facts. Disciplines here were important, but not in isolation from the learning process or from each other. Interestingly, Lachlan regards his thinking on student formation as being influenced more by his experiences as a rector at Dublin than by those as a student at Oxford. For Lachlan, writing about Newman's ideas of a university, the Oxford model reproduces culture through association, whereas the Dublin model reproduced a culture which is also about questioning and learning to see things as they are and of discriminating between truth and falsehood. To Newman, then, a university education was not just about knowledge acquisition, but was also grounded in intellectual growth. He also emphasised the moral and religious formation of students, and he believed a university should give careful consideration to how it cares for the student, as well as how it educates them. He believed consideration should be given to emotional, moral, and intellectual formation. And Newman actually likens a college or a smaller unit within a university based on the Oxford model as a home. And of course, for us, um, that's very much the idea of the university as the alma mater, the mother, knowing the students and knowing our students one by one. For Newman, this notion of student formation as education could not take place in a vacuum. And although he didn't articulate it um, as student formation in his time, Newman was undoubtedly aware of the view that education is about formation rather than just the mere memorising of information and facts. These views are articulated in his description of a university as a place to take students and to, and I quote, turn them into something or other, to mould their characters, form their habits, educate their hearts through educating their minds. Newman also described certain characteristics he thought students should develop through their university experience. And these included being resourceful, having versatility, and being able to make informed judgments. Newman's broad idea of a university was that it was about social, moral, and spiritual formation. 
To Newman, then, it was the process of learning and the self-discipline required for scholarship which forms the student and not solely the memorization of knowledge. The nature of a university and Newman's view of it has some modern parallels. For example, Newman did have a view of a university where the relationship between the tutor and the student was very much at the heart of it and where the relationship was observed to be critically important. Newman might even have taken the view that it was a triangular relationship, the tutor, the student and God, that there were three elements of that triangle and that knowledge was created within that triangular structure and more importantly within that triangular relationship. He also recognised that this didn't imply an equal relationship since God was at the centre of everything. This of course has parallels to the Holy Trinity of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, a triangular relationship which was the heart of Newman's own life. He was very concerned to make sure that the student was someone who was concerned and single-minded in their thinking. He himself led a fairly aesthetic life, devoting his entire attention to the disciplines of philosophy and theology that he was teaching, and the student being formed as part of this. Newman then observes the idea of formation in a focused way and would see education as being formation. Formation in the discipline in terms of a traditional set of relations. To this extent, Newman still held to the idea that education was about formation in a particular kind of way. The formation that he had in mind was related to a cognitive and spiritual life devoted to God and developed for the service of others. So education was not about some liberal and explorative set of relationships, but rather about how we should form people in the image and likeness of God. In the modern view, maybe one would want to raise questions about this model and move beyond formation to transformation. And that's what I want to think about today. And to observe the change being the constant rather than the discipline being the constant, as was common at Newman's time. Newman was well aware that to live is to change. And in that regard, he saw education as an enterprise in which knowledge itself changes. Knowledge nowadays is not the rather static entity that it might have been as a feature of the 19th and early 20th century universities. Nowadays, of course, knowledge is much more dynamic and shifting set of ideas, thoughts and processes, which move us somewhat into the area of transformation rather than just formation. It might be said that education is no longer about information. How can it be as information changes so rapidly in today's modern world with our rapid technological and scientific advances. If it is no longer just about information and formation, I want to argue that mo modern education should be about transformation and a shift in a student's thinking. This shift should see lecturers supporting individuals as lifelong learners who have a role to play in their own transformation and that of society. The transformation of students and indeed transformative learning should seek to bring about changes in the self. And the idea of transformative learning is a relatively new concept. Hilarius is a key figure here and describes such changes in the self as being characterized by a simultaneous restructuring in the cognitive, the emotional and the socio-societal dimensions. That is to say, there are three dimensions to student transformation, as indicated on the slide here. Psychological, so changes in the student's understanding about him or herself. Convictional, a revision or changes to the student's belief systems and set of values. And behavioral, changes in the student's lifestyle and way of living. According to this model, planning a university experience where student transformation might take place requires consideration being given to three types of knowledge which should be integrated in the planned experience of students. These three kinds of knowledge are academic knowledge. So this for me is about scholarship and research and the role of discipline oriented knowledge is critical to this. The second knowledge is professional knowledge 
This allows theory to be explored through practical situations and may be related to professional study, such as in the teacher education programmes, but is not specific to vocationally orientated degrees. And personal knowledge, where the values, aspirations and emotional and for some students spiritual aspects of learning and educating are formed and fostered. With the current emphasis on research, modern universities plan for and can easily facilitate the development of academic knowledge with confidence, or at least an interaction with academic knowledge. In addition, some universities, particularly those offering professional courses and qualifications, such as HOPE, do indeed pay, pay close attention to professional knowledge. But it's the third area of knowledge, personal knowledge, which seems as often overlooked by universities in that it is not explicitly planned for in the curriculum or in the experiences offered to students. It is in the intensity of a situation, the challenge within the learning environment, which develops personal knowledge as students grow in their own understanding of themselves and of what is important to them. And I think, um, for hope, one of the places where we plan for personal knowledge to take place in some of our extracurricular activities, like the Service and Leadership Award. I just wanted um, to pause for a moment and um, think about a few of Newman's contemporaries. So um, it's interesting to note that, that our own founding colleges have existed since 1844, when Newman was seeking to influence higher education in England. And at this time, of course, the Sisters of Notre Dame were establishing educational opportunities for women in Liverpool, and in particular, working class women, two of the groups who were marginalised by Newman's own idea of a university at that time. The Notre Dame philosophy of education was to teach people what they needed for life, not what they needed for an exam. This early commitment to student formation has remained very strong at Liverpool Hope, and a more contemporary commitment to student formation and transformation now underpins our mission and values. While the sisters were not originally seeking to establish a university, which was Newman's goal, they shared his vision of education as a process of learning and formation. Indeed, the Sisters of Notre Dame were successfully developing opportunities beyond school for women in Liverpool at a time when Newman was really failing to make any significant impact on higher education in Birmingham. Perhaps the Sisters' success was due to the fact that they had a shared philosophy of education amongst their community and they worked as a community to promote this, whereas Newman was initially something of a lone voice at Birmingham and then Dublin. Like Newman, the, the sisters were concerned not only with the disciplines, but also with the student experience and the process of learning, underpinned by strong relationships between the students and their tutors, in this case, the sisters themselves. It was the community of learners which the sisters established, which was imp of importance to them. This community of learners, of students and tutors, a collegium which the sisters established, of course continues to underpin the work we do at HOPE in its modern form. I want to um, just think now about um, a model for learning. Um, and a model for learning that I use, um, it's not only the content of the curriculum which is significant, the what of the curriculum, what students study, but also the how, how they study it, the why, why they study it, and the where, what are the environments that they're studying in. And this model emphasizes the interrelatedness of the curriculum with meaningful relationships, with a love of learning, and with the creation of an emotional and spiritual space where learning and transformation can take place. And I would argue that for transformative learning and for student transformation to occur, then all four of these areas need to be present in the student experience. So taking this theme a little bit further, 
In the collegiate environment which shares strong values with Newman, it's important that the learning process does indeed provide opportunities for student transformation and for the development of academic, professional and personal learning. This is why this model for learning is of significance here. And it was the model that we used in the education faculty to develop the disciplines-based approach to education studies. It was our philosophy that in order for learning to take place effectively, there needs to be a number of planned aspects of what can best be described as the environment. These are the curriculum or content, relationships, a disposition to learning, and emotional and spiritual space. These four elements do, con do not constitute a model of learning, but rather a model for learning. That is to say, in my view, they are necessary for learning to occur, and in particular, for transformational learning to occur. What is crucial to this model is that there is a dynamic and integral relationship between these four different elements. The content of the curriculum and the success and opportunity, be, opportunity, be, opportunity to be successful within this. The disposition to learning and creating in students a love for learning, a motivation for learning, not wanting to do it because their exam requires them to do it, but wanting to do it because it excites them, it inspires them, they want to learn more. The relationships that are created in the educational setting or learning environment, and that might be the relationships between students and tutors, students and peers, students and professional colleagues from schools or other environments. And the emotional and spiritual space in which the learning takes place. Central to a university education, or indeed any education, are the relationships which are created in any appropriate context. Through a positive set of relationships, the student or learner forms the scaffolding for his or her thinking and development. This becomes the mental framework that allows the student to make sense of the world. It forms the intellectual and emotional structures which provide the capacity and ability to see the world in different ways. And it is suggested that attention being given to the four aspects in the model, in this model, and the interaction among them will be significant for the engagements of students in more effective learning. I now turn to consider how these four aspects, the curriculum, a disposition to learning, relationships, and the space, might um, relate to Newman's own philosophy of learning and where we can see any examples of it in his writing. So if we start with the curriculum, In the above model for learning, the curriculum is the content, and by that I mean the principles, the knowledge, the ideas, the concepts, the skills that are taught. Newman shared his views on what today would be called the curriculum in his discussion of disciplines and what he understood to be a liberal education. He was of the view that the subject matter or curriculum content should come from a number of academic disciplines. Interestingly, for those of us in faith-based universities, he identified theology as the central focus for any Catholic university. But he was strongly of the view that this should be studied alongside other disciplines. It was important to him that the curriculum should promote a breadth of knowledge with the study of several disciplines and the development of intellectual skills. Thus, students would grow in their thinking as well as their acquisition of knowledge. This was his commitment to a liberal education. Newman's curriculum, therefore, was about formation as well as knowledge transfer. Newman thought that every student should have a liberal university education before studying a profession and becoming too focused on a body of professional knowledge. This would enable the student to be single-minded in his academic study and then subsequently his professional learning rather than for one to be distracted by the other. If we move on to think about relationships, relationships are very much at the heart of learning and of our learning culture at Hope, and you see that for me most explicitly in our seminar groups of 10. And this was true for Newman. 
However, these relationships, Newman argues, must be strong, as weak relationships cannot convey values and respect or support the dialogue and exchange of ideas which are so crucial for learning, in which deep understanding is to take place. Carpenter and McMullen highlight Newman's view of a university as a place for communication of thought by means of personal intercourse, as in the university here, with the exchange of ideas, dialogue, and interaction amongst students and tutors, which was at the heart of Newman's university. Newman writes that the teacher is the living voice, the breathing form. In, in Newman's view of a university, it's the relationship between the teacher and the student which is important. The teacher using questions as a teaching strategy and acting as a guide to the student to find their way through the discipline. The basis then of this learning relationship is a dialogue and interaction between student and teacher. And this formulation of relationship is at the heart of the philosophy which underpins our commitment to the seminar groups. The seminar groups enable tutors to know their students well, something that Newman advocated strongly. Of course, in the current economic climate of higher education, it requires very careful resource planning elsewhere in the course, but it's something that our university has remained committed to. Thinking about the disposition to learning, the contemporary university should be a place which is exciting, vibrant, enjoyable and engaging and is one that is underpinned by challenging academic disciplines. Such a university, I think, can develop a passion for learning amongst students and amongst tutors for that matter in relation to the formal curriculum. The facilitation of meaningful relationships across the university community can further promote a positive attitude and approach to learning. In a process of transformation, students should come to recognise and use their peers' assets, the gifts and talents that each student brings to the community, encouraged and guided by their tutor. This process is about students recognising themselves as learners and becoming passionate about their learning, confident in and with their own learning styles. The student experience is always paramount and the pedagogy should address the varying needs of students. While this can be seen to be Newman-esque, the contemporary application of electronic platforms for learning, for example, is very different from the intimacy of the Oxford tutor's study. Finally, thinking about the emotional and spiritual space, it's important that effective learning for all teachers, for those in higher education and elsewhere, gives attention to creating space for the flourishing of students in terms of emotional and spiritual well-being. In the culture of control in which we find ourselves today, I believe that educational institutions should support an environment in which there is freedom to be an autonomous learner. Therefore, it's my contention that the effective, active student should not be characterised by compliance, but rather by their enterprise and their own creativity. It's difficult to find explicit reference to space in Newman's ideas. It was not a particularly recognised concept of the time in the way it is today. But Newman does write about the process of learning on numerous occasions. In the idea of a university, he strongly supports the notion of the university as a residence without examinations, rather than examinations without residence. I take this to mean that universities should promote an environment or education which provides space for the student to think and reflect. Any effective process of learning must provide space for reflection, not just academic reflection, but also professional and personal, an emotional and spiritual space for students. This is important if the psychological, convictional and behavioural transformations referred to earlier are to take place. 
Of course, at Hope, we recruit students and staff of all faiths and no faith, and in doing so, we provide spaces and opportunities, both physical and otherwise, for students to develop emotionally and spiritually. Some of that um, is planned and in the formal curriculum. Some of it, it operates in a more informal way. And those of you that teach in the Eden building will know the opportunities that the space there provides for relationships, for exploring learning. In conclusion then, if we reflect on Newman's philosophy for a higher education, it's particularly interesting when it's localized within the only ecumenical university in Europe. In this paper, I've sought to suggest how Newman's views of higher education might be of wider interest to the university of the 21st century. At Oxford, he was part of the establishment of the tutor system there. This really formed his thinking about education and his reflection on the idea of a university. Indeed, his idea of a university was clearly based on his experience at Oxford with its intimate engagement of students and strong relationships. These considerations were not part of the thinking of Oxford or of, or of Newman that we have here today with an emphasis on democracy and wider access and participation. These then are much more elements of the model of the industrial university developed during the 20th century, so some may question why Newman's ideas remain of such interest and relevance. I've sought to show how some of Newman's key thinking in relation to the student and the student experience is still a very contemporary theme and of great relevance to us in universities today. I wanted to um, almost finish with this uh, quote here from Newman. A university training is the great ordinary means to a great but ordinary end. It aims at raising the intellectual tone of society at cultivating the public mind, at purifying the national taste, at giving enlargement and sobriety to the ideas of the age. It is the education which gives a clear conscious view of his own opinions and judgments, a truth in developing them, an eloquence in expressing them, and a force in urging them. Newman was writing in the 19th century and articulated his ideas according to the rhetoric and terminology of the time. He didn't write about student formation as such, but the importance of formation can clearly be observed in many of his ideas, as I've sought to show today. If he was writing today, he may well have moved his thoughts from formation to transformation. This is because a transformative education is one which seeks to develop in students a clear conscious view of their own opinions and judgments, a truth in developing them, an eloquence in expressing them, and a force in urging them, to give them voice. Nonetheless, there would have been that constant struggle between the knowledge base of education and the processes which lead to that knowledge. The modern university may well have a different emphasis, highlighting ideas which were still a little in the shadow of Newman's writing. Today we acknowledge the absolute need for change and the place of the transformed student as a lifelong learner. Newman set us on an interesting journey of thought and characteristically perhaps a journey without a destination. Thank you.